you record them. You uh, make DVDs and CDs. You have concerts. Um, you give them platforms. And you produce revenue. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do with the green energy. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you do with the money that comes from this right. stuff. Well, you know, again, um, as you're going through this journey, we did never think that there would be any. So we figured, well, regardless, let's make our intentions again positive. So let's say to the musician, you own your music. Whether it's a cover song or an original, that's a separate issue and let the powers that be determine what happens. But this is your music and we're here to document and share it with the world through our platform, but it's yours. Now, when we make the songs around the world, we also realize like, well, we have to give equity. We have to give a part of what this is to the musicians um, in two formats. One, we have to, we pay every musician on the spot a negotiated rate that makes them feel the rule that we had was, let's make them have one of the best experiences of their life. Whatever threshold that is for that person is where we want to go. We want to be the people that went above, not below. Now, you know, we're not talking about a massive amount of money because it's a small amount of time and they're already doing it anyway. I'm not asking them to come to a staged event. They're performing, we show up, we meet them in the proper context. Sometimes they're playing and we just set up our gear and just start to record because we got to get the moment. But we would never take it without a, you know, without a discussion with them. And the other thing is it was saying, like, let's build a global family. Well, I'm not going to build a global family if I come here and rip you off. And I'm not going to inspire anyone if I come here and rip you off. Yeah. So it's really like, okay, let's just do this right. Let's do it humble and slow and steady. And so for a long time, it was just simply cash to the musicians. Um, as we started to go around the world and make these songs, it became really interesting because foreign languages and different um, monetary systems and different cultures, and you don't, well, that's where my interpersonal communication came in really well, where how do they make sense of the world, not how do I make sense of their economics? Who are they? What's gonna make them feel proud with this experience? And that's where I wanna go. So it's always been sort of done in that context and nothing is perfect, I mean, this is life, but we've done our best to always reach for that sort of energy. And the interesting thing about the project, you know, if we're gonna to jump to now present day, is just that because of the fact that we were able to finally reach a, a system that could not only reach a lot of eyeballs, but also lead to revenue, it's been an amazing thing to watch. Whether it's positive or negative, I think you could debate that all day, but what it is, is changing, because suddenly these musicians who, for example, uh, Grandpa Elliot, who's uh, yeah, one of my heroes in life, you know, here he is. Do you think been... possibly a, a distant relative? Yeah. Me. <laughs> well, I could see your, the, the love in both of your eyes. You know, that would be the, the connection. I, I, I spell my name with one T. But right. I see a similarity. Yeah. <laughs> He's your sole brother. Yeah. yeah, so you know, you give somebody like Grandpa, look, you, you spend, what, 20, 30 minutes of time with him, putting on headphones, playing Stand By Me. Um, he since then receives an equity portion of the, the revenue that comes from the track, and it's a life-changing experience for him. It's a type of situation where suddenly, you know, he has opportunities that otherwise he wouldn't have had. Now, I, I, whether I wanna, it's better or worse... I don't, you know. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, no, no, no. but um, looking after my brother here, <laughs> Grandpa Elliot is not homeless anymore. No, no, and Grandpa, but, but he is blind. He's a blind musician. He's gone blind over time, and he often laughs about that because he used to play the role of a blind man on the street to get more people... More <laughs> to be involved, <laughs> and now he's a blind man I on the street. I, I, I just want to be certain, because all of these voices that I'm hearing that have touched mm -hmm. me so much, mm -hmm. um, I just want to make certain that they're covered. Yeah, no, they and are. That, and that it, None it, of them are home. It, the, 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 the primary people that we're talking about, 
They're not homeless. Yeah, no, anymore. none of them are. No, none of them are. That's, you understand, Mark. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, the Zulu choir on Stand By Me, many of the Zulu choir and many people in, in South African townships, a huge percentage of people have HIV. So sudden, and, and because of the, the, the situation down there, they can't even talk about it. They can't even tell you if they do or if they don't because suddenly their humanity is ripped from them because of judgment placed yes. upon them by society. So here we are recording a Zulu choir, in all likelihood many of them suffering from HIV. They bring so much humble joy and spirit. I never seen any people more happy in my life. And then I get to send them from the first batch thousands and thousands of dollars in a check. And in their economy is life changing, you know? Okay. So I, I think that we felt the joy, but now money is money. Money is good, money is bad. So, you know, let the musicians sort that out for themselves. But at least it's now part of uh, something that's real. So, the musicians, the musicians are covered economically. Mm -hmm. But then with the uh, revenue that comes in for uh, all the ancillary sales, what do you do with that money beyond the musicians? Right, well, I, to be honest with you, as we were traveling, you know, a bunch of interesting things happened. For example, it's an interesting thing because per perhaps it was um, my lack of experience, but I didn't oftentimes predetermine where we were going to go. It was almost as if we could have parachuted into these places. We didn't know anyone. Uh, perhaps they weren't safe. A number of places were very violent. We ended up at the murder capital of the world. and. You know, here we are with our crew, and we didn't even know that. Until what is the murder capital? At the time, it was Soweto, South Africa. And so here we are, you know, going to all these sort of places, and um, they would invite us into their homes. They would play us songs. They would feed us. I mean, people in the most obscure places in the world just took us in and said, yeah, I want to be a part of this. How did that happen? I mean, I think you, it happened. You just show up at their door and say hi? I'm Mark. You know, normally what I would do is a, essentially my iPod video. That was the, that was the saving grace. You would show, I would this, show is, this them, is me, this is what I do. I would show them stand by me wherever it was at that time as it was getting created. That was the calling card. And they would watch it. And then I would say, listen, I'm not here for your struggle. I'm not here for your conflict. And I'm not here for any negativity. I'm only here to connect the positivity in you to the rest of the musicians and the audience so we can do something bigger for the human race, which by the way, I know you're a part of. You know, it was that sort of thing. So whether I was in Israel and Palestine or in a South African township, it was never about their local situation. It was about the greater consciousness of the humanity that we were trying to tap into. And so I guess to make a long story short, the idea here was we better give back. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and we've used the word of a movement for playing for change. But, you know, the reason was it wasn't because I want it to be a movement or anything. It was because when you look at the faces of the people who are both performing, watching and involved, it mattered at such a deep level. Yeah. And because of that, it became something where when we left, it was a very important thing to those people, and so on, and so on, and so on. And suddenly you feel like you're representing and you're carrying with you the energy of the masses that you have tapped into in a very humble, positive way. And that's when Whitney Cronkey and myself, we said, listen, we better do something to give back to the people. We set up the Playing for Change Foundation. 